read this primary source document for you. And I'm also gonna read primary source document number two. So here we go. This one is document one. Catherine Beecher on the duty of American females in 1837. In 1836, abolitionist and women's rights leader Angelina Grimke wrote appeal to the Christian women of the South, and it urged them to take a stand against slavery. Catherine Beecher wrote the piece excerpted below in response. So this is Catherine Beecher talking to Miss Grimke. It seems unwise for ladies of non-slaveholding states to unite themselves in abolition societies. This issue is already dividing the nation. If the women excite public opinion too much, this will cause the nation to rupture itself. What if the South severs itself from the nation? How will the nation survive? So she uses the word severs. Severs means separate or cut off from. Heaven has made one gender the superior, males, and to the other delegated the junior position. It is in the interest of women to not challenge this heavenly order. Similarly, you would not want a child to rule their parents or a subject to overthrow their ruler. Though they have this lesser role, women still have influence and can exercise power in a quieter and more peaceful way. Women are to win influence by making sure she is loved. This will make people love her and wish to please her. Men will then listen to her ideas and carry them forward. This should happen only in domestic or social circles. Our social order depends on women remaining her in places as a dependent person who needs man to protect her. If she speaks out, seeks ambition, or has a thirst for power, she's opening herself up to attack. A woman may seek the cooperation of other women, but in maternal or domestic duty only. If she is driven to exert her influences or ideas on other issues of national import, this throws her out of the appropriate sphere, disrupts natural order. It is asked, may not women appropriately come forward then on behalf of enslaved women? It is replied that petitions from females will frustrate and anger men, seem intrusive, they will force a deeper wedge between pro and anti-slavery politics. And so it is unwise. In this country, petitions to Congress in reference to the laws and rules of our nation or duties of Congress in all cases fall to men. Men are the proper persons to make appeals to the rulers whom they appoint. But it may be asked, is there nothing to be done to bring this national sin of slavery to an end? Must the internal slave trade, a trade now ranked as piracy among all civilized nations, still prosper in our bounds? Must not females open their lips and bring such shame and sin to an end? To this, it may be replied, women can do and say much to bring these evils to an end, but in an appropriate manner, by assuming the advocate and mediator of peace, by employing her influence, not for the purpose of exciting the public and inspiring agitation, but by promoting a spirit of morality and charity. So, this is Miss Catherine Beecher, and again, she's responding to Angelina Grimke's speech. Okay, so that was primary source number one. So let's read primary source number two and see what that one says. Angelina Grimke, Human Rights Not Founded on Sex or Gender, August 2nd, 1837. Published in the abolitionist paper, The Liberator. After reading Catherine Beecher's essay in 1836, Angelina Grimke published 12 letters in response defending the rights of women to take part in political debate. This is an excerpt from one of those 12 letters. We are led to examine why human beings have any rights. It is because they are moral beings. They are creatures who have morals, understand morals, know right from wrong actions and behaviors. The rights of all men, from king to the slave, are built upon their moral nature. And as all men have this moral nature, so all men essentially have the same rights. Now it naturally occurred to me that if the rights were founded in moral being, then the assigning of gender could not give to man higher rights and responsibilities than to woman. When I look at human beings as moral beings, all distinction in gender sinks to insignificance and nothingness, for I believe it regulates rights and responsibilities no more than the color of the skin or the eyes. My doctrine then is that whatever it is morally right for a man to do, it is morally right for women to do. Our rights are governed not by difference of gender, but by our wealth, knowledge, the variety of natural gifts and talents we each have, and the different eras in which we live. This regulation of duty by gender, rather than by fundamental principle of moral being, has led evils flowing from masculine and feminine roles in society. By this doctrine, man has been converted to the warrior, clothed in sternness, while women have been relegated to a pet, a mere thing of luxury to be humored and spoiled like a child, or converted to a mere slave to please her lord and master. This principle has spread throughout the world and given men the character to exercise tyranny, selfishness, pride, arrogance, lust, and brutal violence. 
It has robbed women of essential rights, the right to think and speak and act on all great moral questions, the right to share responsibilities, dangers, and toils. Women, instead of being re regarded as equal to the man, has uniformly been looked down upon as his inferior, a mere gift to, to fill up his happiness. I recognize no rights but human rights. I know nothing of men's rights and women's rights. I believe the discussion of human rights in the North has been of an immense advantage to this country. The discussion of slavery has opened up the way for the discussion of other rights, and the ultimate result will be most certainly the breaking of every restriction, letting the oppressed go free, an emancipation far more glorious than any world yet ever seen, for women of all kinds and all and humans of all races. Okay, so those are the two documents that you should have read.